respected scholars, brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The concept of time is one of the most important concepts in Islamic thought, and indeed one of the most important concepts in human thought in general. A concept which has plagued the mind of many a great philosopher, many a great scientist, and indeed many a great mystic, who have all sought to elucidate on the concept of time and its relation to the life of the human being. Both Muslim and non-Muslim mystics, and indeed Muslim and non-Muslim philosophers, have sought to examine the relationship between the actions of the human being and the time within which that human being lives. Hence, when you look within Islamic circles, you find philosophers such as Mir Damad, or Ibn Sina, or Mullah Sadra, all looking at the concept of time and all elucidating different theories. At the same time, if you were to look at philosophers such as Bergson or McTaggart, they come forward with their own theories about time in order to allow the human being to understand what exactly his position is within the spectrum of time. To some, the idea is that God creates time and that time is subject to God's laws and that God is outside the dimension of time. To others, time is a figment of our imagination that we use time to structure our life, yet time is not real. To a third group, time is just a receptacle for predestined events to occur in the world. Time was used as the intermediary for these events to take their shape. Therefore, you find both within the religion of Islam and outside of the religion of Islam, man has sought to understand his position or her position within time. Because some have been defeated by time, whereas others were in control of their time. And that's why tonight's examination seeks to elucidate on the Islamic concept of time through using the Qur'an and the narrative. Because when you look within Islamic literature, especially 20th and 21st century literature, there is hardly any works on the subject of time. Even though the subject of time has an important position within the book and the corpus of narration, that Habibullah Ahmed is probably the only author recently who has written any book on Islamic concept of time. His book, Time and Consciousness, which was published recently, is as much of an attempt to elucidate on the Islamic theory of time as there has been by any scholar recently. Yet the reality is that the religion of Islam values time and has a theory of time, a theory which requires a thorough examination. The examination will use Surah al as and I'd like to examine this in a number of stages. Number one, what is the meaning of As and the different interpretations which the scholars offer? Number two, how does time pass us by, and how do we ensure that it doesn't? Number three, what's the metaphysical reality of time and the position of the human being? Number four, how do we learn to value time and what theories are positive? Number five, which characters in history did time defeat? And which characters in history can time never ever forget? When we examine this, we would have examined the topic in depth. The verse in question which I have taken are taken from Surah al as arguably one of the most famous chapters within the Holy Quran, and at the same time one of the most oft-repeated chapters as in many Muslims around the world, have memorized this chapter. A chapter made up of only a few verses, yet a chapter with an unbelievable amount of wisdom, to the extent that Imam al-Shafi'i used to say, the whole of the religion of Islam can be summarized in Surah al as Because when he used to examine Surah al as he would find that its history was quite unique, as in sometimes you don't look for quantity. When you look at wisdom, you look at the quality of the wording. There is someone who may bring you many passages. Yet there are others who in a few lines can summarize the whole meaning of the existence of the human being. To the extent that when this surah was revealed, the narrations tell us that the companions in many cases, before they leave each other, they recite surah al as For example, today, if me and you met, and then we decided to go home, we would say, for example, Ma'as-Salama, or you would say, with a half or you would use all of these words. In those days, the companions, when this surah was revealed, what would they say? 
they would come forward and they were about to leave each other and they would say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal-Hasq, inna al-Insana lafi khuf, illa al-Ladhina amanu wa amanu al-Salihat, wa tawafu bil-Haqq wa tawafu bil-Sabr. Every companion would use this as the method of saying goodbye to each other. And you found that when the Mushrikeen or when the polytheists of Quraysh heard this verse being revealed, it caused shockwaves for many of them. Why? Amr ibn al-As narrates that I was with Musaylam al-Kazab. Musaylam, as you know, later on was the apostate who claimed that he was a prophet as well as the Prophet Muhammad being a prophet. This Musaylam was with Amr ibn al-As. He looked at him, he said to him, what's the new verses of magic that Muhammad has revealed? He said to him, he's just been given a chapter called al Hasq by the time. He said to him, what is it? He began to recite the chapter for him. He said to him, it begins as they begin, in the name of Allah, the most kind, the most merciful. Well, Hasq, inna al-insana lafi khuf, inna al-ladheena amanu wa amilu al-salihat, wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sab. He said to him, what do you think of it? He said, it's a verse which has a lot of meaning, no doubt. At that moment, Musaylam, I looked at Amr ibn al-As, what did he say to him? He said to him, I can make a verse exactly like it, the whole chapter. He said, what is it? He began by saying, well, well. He said, so what did you just say? He said to him, by the name of the larynx. The larynx is an animal which he described as the chapter continued. He said, by the name of the larynx, you are an animal with two ears, a long breath, and a protruding hole at the back. I'm not going to ask him, he said, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, I, you said to me that their verses are amazing, so I bought you a verse or a chapter in exactly the same way. You said, well, I'm, in the insan ala fi khus, illa ladina amin wa amin salihat. Likewise, I'm giving you something with the same way. By the larynx, you are an animal with two ears, a long breath, and a protruding hole. That's him. What do your words have anything to do with what he's saying? You've got a man here who's defining the whole meaning of life. And you've got me, you've got you telling me about an animal nobody's ever seen in their life. What benefit do your words have to the society? Notice Amr ibn al-As' words. In four verses of the Quran, Amr ibn al-As, a renowned member of the Qurayshi hierarchy, looked at these verses and said to himself, but hold on. You may make four verses of Arabic, but Muhammad's four verses aren't words of a human being. They are summarizing the whole meaning of mankind's existence. Therefore, you found at the same time, Amr ibn al-As had only heard Surah al-Asr once. And he didn't need to hear it again for him to memorize the chapter. And that highlights to us why the Holy Quran was revealed in the Arabic language miraculously for the Arabs. Because every prophet of God... His miracle relates to the speciality of his people. To the Prophet Moses, what's his miracle? The magic against the magicians. The Prophet Isa, the medicine with the physicians. Whereas the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family, what's his miracle? His miracle was the Quran in an Arabic language at a time where the best of poets were around. As in Walid ibn al-Mughira, nobody could come near him when it came to Arabian poetry. Walid ibn al-Mughira would hear a line of poetry and memorize it straight away. Likewise, Amr ibn al-As, when he heard this, when Musaylam said to him, in the name of the larynx which has two ears and which has a long breast and a protruding hole, he said to him, your words do not compare to what this man means. The question arises, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mean with these four verses? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wal What's the meaning of af? Let's look at a few interpretations. The first opinion as for the meaning of Af is Allah saying in the name of Salat al-Af. So that we know, we have five daily prayers in the religion of Islam. Some people ask us, why are your prayers so rigid? And why do you set them all on timing? Why can't we just pray 17 units of prayer at the end of the day? We reply by saying that the reason there is a rigidity in our prayer system it's because the aim of prayers is to, as in how many of you have asked yourself the question, or have been asked the question, what's the benefit of prayer? As in, what does it bring me? The benefits of prayer are two things. Number one, discipline. Number two, humility. Discipline meaning what? Put some of us in front of a football screen watching a match. We can watch it for 90 minutes. True or no? Put some of us watching a film for a couple of hours. We can watch it easily. 
Tell someone at 1.15, pray for five minutes on time, he has to pray at 6.45. Five minutes, the human being can't discipline that soul. You find that when the Islam came with these five prayers, it sought to teach the human being that you'll never ever be successful in your life unless you learn how to discipline yourself around timing. I ask any of you here who own businesses, or who are managers, or who work in the work environment, can you ever survive in that environment if you're not disciplined with your timings and your appointments? Never. As if someone makes an appointment with you for 3 o'clock, you turn up at 6.55, you'll never be successful in that environment. People will say that you are ill-disciplined. When the Qur'an and the religion of Islam sets you that five prayers, it was to build the discipline in you. That, oh human being, all I ask from you is five minutes, five times a day at certain periods. Is that really difficult for you as well? As in when it comes to a 25 minutes in the day, is it really difficult to condition yourself and to defeat it, to be able to discipline it? The first reason Salah came was to discipline. The second reason Salah came was to bring humility. You know when Salah came, some of the Arabs said to the Prophet, we'll do everything your religion tells us, except one thing. He said, what is it? They said, there's no way we'll go down in sujood. Why? Because you expect my head to be below my backside? Never. I am an Arab and I am proud of what I have achieved in my life. You expect me to get in a position where this head of mine is on the floor? That I'll never do. When Islam came to institute prayers, because some of us in our life require humility in the day, because we can walk around like the most arrogant human beings. We need five times a day where we say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la wa bihamdih. That I may have acted a'la to all your creation, but you are above me all the time. If the human being has got no discipline and humility, that's not a human being and nothing more. And that's why when God instituted the five prayers, he gave us two options. Either you pray them separately, or you combine them. Many times people attack the school of Ahlul Bayt and the school of Imam al by saying that you are the people who combine. Whereas originally, the meaning was to separate. On the contrary... When you look within the Qur'an, you find that whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses salah, He discusses salah by saying what? He discusses by talking of three periods in the day. أَقِمْ الصَّلَاةَ لِذِلُوكِ الشَّمْسِ إِلَىٰ غَسَقَ اللَّيْلِ وَقُرْآنَ الْفَجْ That's the verse. It doesn't mention five. It mentions three periods, which are then divided into five. أَقِمْ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَيْ النَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ Again, it doesn't mention five periods. It mentions a couple of periods. We came forward and said that in three periods, we divided into five. You have the option of separating Salat al-Asr and Salat al dhuhr or you have the option of combining them as an Imam Abu Hanifa, an Imam Malik, an Imam al-Shafi'i, allow for combination of Salah when? When you are traveling or when it is raining. Only Abu Hanifa says that you can only combine at Muzdalifa. Other than that, they allow combination with restrictions. Sahih Muslim, there is a chapter called the chapter of combining your prayers. The question arises, why would Allah swear by the time of us? It's because certain scholars say us is that which refers to the salah known as salat al-wusta. You know in the Quran it says, Hafibu ala salawat wa salat al-wusta. Protect the prayers and protect the middle prayer. One of the scholars said, when God says, protect the middle prayer, the middle prayer is us. Why? Because it was difficult to pray Salat al-Asr in the heat of Arabia. These people would have to come out and pray that prayer. So Allah named it as the middle prayer. And some people say that that is the meaning of us. That's one opinion for what us means. But that's an opinion which some take, not others. Then there is a second opinion as to the meaning of well us. What is it? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wal he means I am swearing by your time that you are living in. How aware are you of the needs of the time that you are living in? What does this mean? This means that mankind has a responsibility to be aware of the needs and the requirements of the time that they are living in. I as a Muslim will be in loss. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُصْ if I am not aware of the needs of the time that I am living in, as in when we look within Islamic society today, 
In many cases, the Muslims have fallen back when it comes to progress and modernity in their own time. In which way? Many times we see today the world talks of an economic recession. The world talks of an economic downfall. Yet how many Muslims have published books on the Islamic economic system? When the Quran says, well, it is saying, by your time, man is surely in loss if he is not aware of the needs of his time. In all of this economic recession that you see, how many Muslims were aware of the needs of economy in their time? As if you were to ask a Muslim today, you are a Muslim? Yes. Give me the Islamic economic system which will build this country that we're living in. This country tried the capitalist system. It didn't necessarily help it. There may be certain banks which are now closed or building societies. You as a Muslim, the Quran swears by your time. Are you aware of the needs of your time or no? Let me give you a second example. I as a Muslim have to be aware of the needs of bioethics in my time. For example, abortion. Originally, we would say that abortion isn't allowed in any case. But I as a Muslim have encountered now certain issues. For example, thalassemia occurring in that baby. If thalassemia occurs at a certain period for that baby, then what do I do? Am I allowed to abort or no? If I am allowed to abort, can I abort at which period? Before 4 months? Before 40 days? Before 120 days? I need to be aware of what are the progress in science in my time. I can't just simply stick and say, abortion is haram. No. There are principles which the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet have given you for you to be able to meet the needs of your time. Said Ali Khamenei, for example, may Allah lengthen his life, recently gave a verdict on thalassemia and on the allowing of abortion of a baby which has thalassemia. But he made a condition as to when you can abort this baby. Some came forward and said, that's a very reformist thinker, we should stick to the tradition. Whereas to him, when he's looking at the time, he uses the Quran, he uses the Sunnah, to meet the needs of the time. Let me give you a third example. I am a Muslim living in the West. There is a need in my time for what? For education about sexual issues. Why? Because my children are at school. And at these schools, they are given this type of education. Do I come forward and discuss it or not? The mosques which come forward and say, don't discuss it, they are not moving with their time. The Quran, when it says, well, us, Describing you, your time. Are you aware of the needs of your time? That today his sentence has a major headline about a Muslim who is in the same gender relationship. Are we able to discuss such a modern issue in our time? Because if we're discussing the same issues every single year, does it show that we are aware of the needs of our time or no? As in how many Muslims go to their mosques in the holy month of Muharram, they come to the mosque 12 nights, it's the same lecture for 12 nights, repeated over and over again, you find that awareness of one's time is that a person looks at the needs of the society and then asks, my prophet in the Quran or in his sunnah, did he set out principles which will help me to remain modern in my time or no? <laughs> Professor Tariq Ramadan recently wrote a book called Radical Reform. When he wrote Radical Reform, do you know what he said? He said, if you look at the original Muslim scholars, like Abu Hanifa, like Shafi'i, like Shafi'i, he says, when they were building a society, they were building it in accordance with their time. But they were building it in a manner which wasn't too difficult. Why? Because Abu Hanifa only lived 78 years after Rasulullah. So he had the example of Rasulullah, the Islamic empire hadn't grown far and wide. The Islamic empire was still a very limited empire. He said, now in our time, the Islamic empire faces new challenges. I go to work. What do I do? A thousand times a day, I say, sorry, I can't shake your hand. I'm a Muslim. A thousand times a day, I've got clients coming to me all the time who are the opposite gender. So every time one comes in, I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm a Muslim. I'm sorry, I'm a Muslim. What I'm saying is, isn't the changing? No. I'm saying that there is a need to be aware of the time that you shift the religion to be able to counter the needs of the people all around the Islamic world in the time of the original scholars, the world was a completely Eastern world. Now, the world has gone to a Western world. The Quran and the Sunnah are still the same. 
But the usul, the principles that can be taken from the Qur'an and the Sunnah, can be used to bring reform to our time and the needs of our time. Therefore, the second meaning of as means, well, insan al-abikhut, O man, by your time, you'll be in loss if you're not aware of the needs of your time. Therefore, make sure you are aware of the needs of your time. And there's a, there's a third meaning to the word Asr and what Asr. What is it? Some of the scholars take the word Asr literally. How many of you drink Asir? True or no? And when you drink the Asir, what is it? The squeezing of a fruit to make a juice for you. True or no? Some of the scholars said when Allah says, Wal Asr, inna al-insana la fi khas. God is saying very clearly that, oh man, when you squeeze your life and the events and the decisions that you have made, do you reach a conclusion that you've lived a life in loss or a life in gain? Think about it. I'm 18. Someone's 28. Someone's 35. Someone's 40. Someone's 50. Each one of us has to squeeze our life together. When we squeeze our life and look at all the decisions we've made, we'll either reach a conclusion that I am someone in this world who has come forward and given good service back to humanity, or I am someone in this world who has wasted myself. Because you'll find some who, when they squeeze their life and how it's unfolded, they'll reach a conclusion where they'll say, truly I wasted my time. You can never waste time. You only waste yourself. Understand the point? Nobody wastes time. Time continues whether you waste it or not. It continues. It continues to serve society. It continues to build generations. You, the human being, waste yourself. Don't you waste time? How many times do you hear people saying, I shouldn't have wasted my time. You didn't waste time. Time is still existing. You wasted yourself. When the Quran says, Wal al insan the Quran is saying, Oh mankind, constantly reflect, squeeze that life you've lived on this earth and ask yourself, have I lived a life where I'll be in loss in the hereafter? Or have I lived a life where I'll be in gain in the hereafter? Because this religion is nothing more than reflection. This religion is nothing more than reflection. Too many times people, when they look at this religion, they say it's a very dogmatic religion. Haram, halal, halal, haram. Wajib, mustahab, haram, halal. That has an aspect, without a doubt. You need a jurisprudence. But at the same time, you need a human who's constantly reflecting about the way they've lived their life. And as the Holy Prophet said, one hour of reflection is greater than 70 years of worship. Because without reflection, the Quran, what does it teach us about time? If you don't reflect on your life, then you'll answer like three different people answered in the Quran. I think I've been asleep for a day or part of a day. What does it mean? It means that there are some of us, when we reach a certain age, when we look back, how many of you now at your age, you look back and you think, has it gone past that quickly? How many of us? When we look back, we think, has it gone past that quickly? Only a couple of days ago, me and you were brought up together. Now we look at each other, has it gone past that quick? The Quran concept of time tells you that all mankind, don't reach that situation where you say, I think it's just been a day or part of a day. Because if you're not careful, time will pass you by and defeat you. Let me give you an example in the Quran of someone who said this. On there, the Prophet of God for the children of Israel was walking past the town which was in ruins. This town was in ruins. He looked at it. When he looked at it, he said, I wondered who can make this which is dead be raised again. As soon as he did this, what did God cause to happen to him? God caused him to die there and then. When God caused him to die there and then, he caused him to die for how many years? For a hundred years. At the time he was 30. He caused him to die for a hundred years. He then brought him back to life again. When Uzair went well up, he said something which many of us may say if we don't carefully reflect about the way time is going past us and defeating us. When he woke up, he looked around and he was asked, well, how long have you been asleep? He replied, a day or a part of a day. To him, there and then, what did he show us? He had been asleep for a hundred years. But because he hadn't necessarily understood the concept, what did he look at it as? I've been asleep for a day or a part of a day. The Quran showed him, oh, Uzair, you've been asleep for a hundred years. Do you see how time can pass you by that quickly? 
that because you haven't reflected on the way you are treating time, that time has passed you by quickly without you realizing. I remember our 50 mom was asked, which twins were born on the same day? They died on the same day. One died at the age of 150, the other died at the age of 50. Which twins were born on the same day? And they died on the same day. One was 150, the other was 50. He said, Uzair and his brother Aziz. Listen, what do you mean? He said, Uzair and his brother Aziz were born on the same day. They were twins. Uzair died, Allah caused him to die at the age of 30. True or no? But Aziz remained alive. He died for 100 years, then he came back alive and lived for 20 years. So he was 50. His brother who had been alive all that time was 150. But the point being was what? That Uzair, what did he say? I think it was a day or a part of a day. If you don't reflect on time, it goes past you. Ashab al How many years they slept in the cave? How many years? 309 years they slept in the cave. When they woke up, somebody asked them, How long do you think we've been asleep? What did they reply? A day or a part of a day? 300 years mankind has been asleep. But when he wakes up, he only realizes, what does he realize? I think it's only been a day. Those years have swiftly gone past him. Likewise, on the day of judgment, when we wake up from our sleep, when we wake up from that sleep on the day of judgment, what will we say when we are asked, how long have you been asleep? What will the reply be? A day or a part of a day. Because the human being, either time controls him or he controls time. And I tell you, the religion of Islam, it's the Islamic concept of time, is that, oh human being, I have honored you so much that you can control time if you want. It should serve you. You shouldn't serve it. Do you know why? This Lord who you pledged an allegiance to before you came to the world, the Lord who made the angels bound down to you, the Lord who gave a trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains and they couldn't take them, but you, the human being, took them. This Lord, in telling you all of this, is saying, that when I put you on the earth, don't let time defeat you. You should be the one who defeats time. In the idea that Amir al-Mumin has an unbelievable line of poetry. He says, What does he say? The disease is within you, but you do not see. But the cure is within you, but you do not sense. You are the open book, who with your ability, the unseen can be seen. Do you think you're something small when the whole world exists within you? How does he say this? He's trying to portray to us that mankind, when you live in time, don't let time control you. No, reach a position where you are in charge of time where you don't allow time to be distant from you, as in when you look at the Qur'an, how many times you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling us, I don't want time to be distant from you. I want you to feel time is part of your development. And the Qur'an, Allah always uses the word, wazkur, wazkur, wazkur. Tell me, do I remember Abraham or no? I don't remember Abraham. I've never met him. Wazkur Musa, do I remember Musa? Wazkur Isa, I don't remember Isa. But the usage of West Quran according to certain scholars is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, don't look at too much of a distance between you two. He is living in the same world you're living in. Remember that you are part of the development which he originated. Feel part of his time, not outside of his time. Because you know why? What is the Islamic concept of time? Islam says, don't count every hour. Make every hour count. That's the difference. Don't count every hour. Make every hour count. Look at the difference. There are some people sitting in the world counting the hours. Counting the hours. There are others who say, there's no way I'm counting the hours. I'm going to make every hour count. Because that type of human being values time. They don't neglect it. And the problem with some parts of the Muslim world is that we don't value time. We let it go past us until we go down on the earth and say, Ya Laytani Qaddamsu Li Hayati. We go down on the earth and say, I wish I had given something in this life. And you have to value every aspect of life. And every aspect of time, I'll ask you these questions. Do you know what the value of one year is? Ask a student who's failed their exam. And they have to do a retake. They'll tell you the value of one year. Do you know what the value of one month is? The value of one month. Ask a lady who gave birth prematurely. 
and she'll tell you the value of what? The value of one month. Do you want to know what the value of one week is? Ask a journalist about politics, he'll tell you the value of one week. One week a country has no mention, the next week he's on the front lines filming everything. True or no? If you want to value one day, ask a person who's working and has hungry children at home and he's waiting for his wages. He'll tell you the value of that whole one day. You want to know the value of one hour? Ask two lovers who are about to come back and meet each other. And they'll tell you the value of that one hour. That's when you know you're one hour away from seeing the one you love. How much intense love you have inside you. They'll tell you the value of one hour. Do you want to know the value of one second? Ask someone who's just narrowly missed an accident. And they'll tell you the value of one second. Do you want to know the value of one millisecond? This is the power of time in Islam. One millisecond? Ask a swimmer who got a silver medal in the Olympics. Drawn off. He'll tell you the value of one millisecond. That the person ahead of him just touched the bar ahead of him. The point is that every minute that goes past in this world, the Muslim should ask, is time defeating me or am I defeating time? Am I counting every hour or am I making every hour count? Because there's some of us, we talk and we plan, and we talk and we plan, nothing comes at the end of it. There are others, no. We talk and the action will come straight away. I remember Hajjaj bin Yusuf al-Thaqafi was walking in Kufa one day. When he was walking in Kufa, he heard this man who was talking to himself. The man had just bought a stall and he didn't notice Hajjaj was walking. What did he say? He said, now that I've bought this stall, I'm going to make the great amount of yogurt and sell it to the people of Kufa. And when I make that great amount of yogurt and sell it towards the people of Kufa, after that I'm going to open another stall. After I open that other stall, I'm going to open ten other stalls. After I open ten other stalls, I'm going to be so rich, I'm going to propose for Hajjaj's daughter. When I propose for Hajjaj's daughter, I'm going to beat her in the same way he beats us when he walks in the market. As he was saying, I'm going to beat her like this, he hit the stall, the whole stall fell down. Hajjaj looked at him and said, come here. Did you just say this about my book? He said, yes. He said, I might as well beat you now. You planned so much, but you, instead of making every hour count, you were just counting the hours. Come, I'll show you what every hour count means. Hey, Hajjaj taught us a lesson in the situation that Hajjaj was saying to the man, you talk and you talk. Time is flying and you're wasting it. Instead of just saying, I'm going to do it and act on it, how do you say, do you hear saying, I don't want to be religious now. After Hajj, I'll be religious. It's as if someone gave them a certificate saying, after Hajj, you'll be alive, inshallah. Or there are some who say, after marriage, I'm going to be religious. Now, I'm not sure. It's as if someone gave them a certificate saying, after marriage, you're going to be religious. Nobody's giving you a certificate. Either you reach a level where you are able to control time, or there's a situation where time comes and it overcomes you. And that's why when you look at Islamic history, what do you find? In Islamic history, you find there are certain people who time was able to defeat them. And then there are other people who they defeated time in such a way that for all eternity, their names will be on the list of human beings until the day of judgment. In terms of those who time defeated them, you find they were the type of people who chased this world and its pleasures. They ran after it, at the end, time forgets about them. And they aren't honored. Let me give you an example. Mughira bin Shu'ba Thaqafi. Mughira ibn Shu'bah was known as being from one of the most prestigious tribes of Ta'if. A person from Banu Saqif, related to Ali al-Akbar's mother Layla. This Mughira ibn Shu'bah was originally the governor of Kufa. His pride and joy in this world was what? How much power can I accumulate? That's the only aim. It's ironic that those types of people, time defeats them. What did he do when he was governor of Kufa? Muawiyah wanted to remove him. When he wanted to remove him, he said to him that I want to replace you with Ziyad ibn Habi. When Mughira heard this, what did he do? He worked diligently, running after this world. To do what? He went to an area. He said to Muawiyah, if you're going to remove me from Kufa, I'm going to be in charge of this area. Why did he say that? Because there was someone called Qais in that area who didn't like Muawiyah. 
He knew that if he said he's going to go to that area, what will happen? He knew that him and Qais will be strong enough for Muawiyah to think twice. So what did Muawiyah say to him? Muawiyah said to him, Mughira, don't worry about it. I'll keep you in Kufa. He was happy to stay in Kufa. <coughs> A couple of years later, Muawiyah said, I'm going to make Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al become governor of Kufa. Mughira again became scared. Because his life or joy in this world was what? Not working to achieve the hereafter. No. How much power can I get in this world? And those people, you don't remember them at all with grace. When he heard Abdullah bin Amr ibn al-As, he came to Muawiyah. said, Muawiyah, Muawiyah, are you going to allow Amr ibn al-As to be your governor in Egypt and Abdullah to be governor in Kufa? You're going to have the teeth of two lions surrounding you. So Muawiyah said to him, you're right actually, I'm going to leave you in Kufa. Look how hard he worked in Kufa to achieve that. Only a year or so later, a plague hit Kufa, which he died from. Tell me in the world today, how many people go and encircle the grave of Mughira bin Shahra? On the contrary, how many people have even written about the greatness of Mughira? How many people even honor Mughira bin Shahra? He ran after this world and nothing more. Yet you find time defeats him, where time doesn't have a place for him in society, except for the concept like this. Look at Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan. Abd al-Malik ibn Marwan, what was he looking for? Nothing more than power. He looked for power and thought that that will bring him eternal happiness. Time has deleted him from the books except mentioning him as an Umayyad Khalifa. And what did his power bring him? Abd al-Malik died with a disease where if he drank water, he died. If he drank water, he died. He had to stay away from water. If he stays away from water, then he'll stay alive. And imagine the thirst that overcomes you. All the palaces of Medina and the palaces of Sham, what do they bring the man? The man dies of a disease like this, and at the end, does time remember him with anything? Time just simply says, that's all he died with and nothing more. Mutawakkil al-Abbasi, you look at his life, he had all the palaces, attacked al Muhammad. What did he achieve in his lifetime? His son, Muntasar, ends up killing him because he used to make fun of Amir al-Mu'mineen. When you run after this world and nothing more, and there is no aim to go for the hereafter, time will defeat you. That's why one of the scholars refers to this in a quite majestic line. Do you know what he says? He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr min al-Insan ala fi khas illa al-Ladina amanu. Do you know what he says about the tafsir of this? He says, Wa al-Asr min al-Insan ala fi khas means all mankind. If you're only going to rely on time, then you'll be defeated. But if you rely on your belief and hold on to it, you'll be successful. Look at the way he turns it around. Oh mankind, if you're only going to think of your time, which is limited, you'll be defeated. But if you have the iman, notice, if I only think of time, I may be defeated. But if I hold on to iman and then use time as an intermediary, I'll be successful. And when you look at those members of this earth who lived in this world not chasing it, you find that time can never forget them. Be it an Islamic scholar or a non-Muslim scholar, when they write about their lives, they write about them as if time should serve them, rather than them serving time. Abu Dhabi al-Ghafari, when Ali Shariati wrote his book on Abu Dhabi al-Ghafari, he highlighted that I, who am trained in the Sorbonne in Paris, I have a Western education and an Eastern education. That when I'm in the Sorbonne in Paris, when I talk of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, it's as if Abu Dhar al-Ghafari is a figure for the East and the West. And when I talk about him, time can never forget a man like Abu Dhar al-Ghafari. Why? Because a social, political person like Abu Dhar, time submits itself to him. It doesn't allow him to be forgotten. When Rasulullah went towards the Battle of Tabuk, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari was lagging behind. Do you know when he was lagging behind what happened? He couldn't reach the rest of the companions. When they reached the area of the battle, some of them said, Abu Dhar, where is he? You said that Abu Dhar al-Ghafari is your great companion. He is a man whose words are words of truth. Look at him. He left our army and didn't come. Rasulullah put his hand up and said, Ya Allah, if you are pleased with Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, let him turn up. Do you know what had happened? Abu Dhar al-Ghafari on the way, he had fallen because of the heat. Eventually he managed to reach Rasulullah. When he reached Rasulullah, Rasulullah looked at him. Notice how Abu Dhar, I'm mentioning his example because time will never erase Abu Dhar. 
Because the principles were higher than time. There was Iman. And when you have Iman, you look at time and you use it as a means, not an end. Abu Dhar al Ghafari, what did he do? He reached there and he fell near Rasulullah. When he fell near Rasulullah, Rasulullah looked at him. The Sahaba said to him, Abu Dhar, what's wrong? Why were you lagging behind? He said, I had fallen because of the heat. Why did you fall because of the heat? Why didn't you drink water? He said, I came near an oasis of water. When I was about to drink from it, I said, How can I drink water while I don't know if my beloved Rasulullah may be thirsty? Imagine that mentality. Look how unique that mentality is. It's the mentality not of a human being. It's the mentality of a human being who is in charge of time and wants to make sure that time serves humanity. Likewise, you find a person like Amir al-Mu'mineen. Can time forget Ali ibn Abi Talib? As in forget what Muslims talk about Ali ibn Abi Talib. Go to George George Jack the Christian and say to him, Why did you name your book Ali ibn Abi Talib, Sawt al-Adal al-Insaniyya? The voice of human justice. Why? Because he himself says, time can never forget Ali ibn Abi Talib. On the contrary, time doesn't have the ability to erase a man with the principles of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Others, they've been erased and nobody remembers them but oppression. So Ali ibn Abi Talib, I'm a Lebanese Christian. I have nothing to do with Islam. But you don't need to be a Muslim to appreciate Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's on the second level. On the third level, Aba Abdullah al Hussein. When you look at his life, you find recently a PhD was written. The mystical aspects of the last hour of the life of Hussein ibn Ali. Written by whom? One of our people? Of course not, our people. Written by one of the non Muslims. The non Muslim writes a whole book, a whole PhD. The mystical aspects of Aba Abdullah's life. Do you know what he's referring to? He refers to those words when he's on the ground in Karbala. He's on the ground with arrows surrounding his body. He says, can time ever forget a human being who when arrows had surrounded his body, all he could say was, oh my Lord, what did I lose when I found you? And what did I find when I lost you? Oh my Lord, every bit of this body, if it's chopped into pieces, people will know that each piece was out of love for you. And out of love what you've given me. This man writes in his PhD that this is a man time will never forget. Because time was meant to serve personalities like this. That if you squeeze the life of Abba Abdullah and the literal meaning of us, you'll find that his life was nothing more to the benefit and to the service of humanity, even those human beings who didn't honor him. There was a story in relation to him which states that one day this young man was circumambulating the Kaaba. He saw this girl in front of him. When he saw her, he was disgusted by her. He was attracted by her. He came to her and he touched her hand near the Kaaba. When he touched her hand near that Kaaba, what happened? The two of their hands got stuck together. He couldn't remove his hand. And it was a situation which had never been seen before near the Kaaba. That a man had the arrogance of holding a girl's hand. Who is not mahram to him right near the Kaaba? They went around asking, is there a person who could supplicate to the Lord so that these hands are separated? They found Abba Abdullah. When they came towards him, do you know what they said to him? Come and pray for this man. He came and prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, forgive the man. In my name, the man's hands were separated. Do you know why time will never forget Abba Abdullah? Because this same man on the night of the 11th of Muharram sees Abba Abdullah's body lying in the ground in Karbala. See that holy hand which Rasulullah used to kiss and he used to bring up. That man came and saw the fingers of Abba Abdullah lying there. That man whose hands had been separated through the help of Imam al Hussein. Look at Imam al Hussein lying on the ground. The man comes and sees a ring which he wants. Yet what's the only way of him getting the ring? To chop the finger of Abba Abdullah while he's lying on the ground. And he came and he cut the finger of Abba Abdullah and took that ring away from him. Time doesn't forget people like Abba Abdullah. Why? Because he looked above humanity. He looked to serve humanity. Time at the end became his servant. And that's why the final interpretation of Wal'as is Wal'as al insan al ladina amanu refers to Imam Sahib al Asr wa Zaman that he is the master of the time as he is Allah's Hajj on earth. And that it's the role of the human being to have the belief and the patience to serve him. That if the human being doesn't have this, 
والعام إن الإنسان لفي خوف by the time of the iman man will be in loss إلا الذين آمنوا those who believe in him وعملوا الصالحات and work for his return every day in their lives go to YouTube tonight look at a new documentary called Age of Reappearance it's a new documentary about the return of the Imam it's just been made by a few brothers a 10 part series and look at the power of that documentary where it shows you that if you don't want to be lost in this time then have the belief and work for the Imam and you will be of those who will be rewarded in the hereafter we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep us on the path of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad. And to raise your hand, brothers, raise your hand a little bit. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be on the path of Muhammad and Al-Muhammad. Raise us with them on the day of judgment. Allow us to receive their intercession. Allow us not to count the hours, but to make every hour count. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be amongst those who follow their message. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before us is Fatiha and before us allows us to follow us. Oh.